Stephen Bolt and Catherine Galley for, for bringing me in and, and to Chancellor Hans for um, supporting this, uh, this endeavor here at Texas Tech. I'm really, really delighted to be here this afternoon. And after the very hair-raising flight I had last night as we descended into Lubbock, I'm just really glad that I'm on the ground, um, whether it is in Lubbock or elsewhere. So uh, thank you for inviting me to Texas Tech, and I'm really glad to be talking to you about one of the topics that I've spent a lot of my own academic career um, thinking about and worrying about, and I look forward to your questions during the q and I'm going to speak for about um, 45 minutes, and, and then we have about 45 minutes of, of Q&A. So uh, the title of the talk, as you can see, is Are We Rome or Greece? America's Infatuation with Antiquity. Antiquity. And I'm going to take you through some of the major episodes in American history that testify to the long uh, and, and very interesting relationship that America has had with uh, these two particular uh, civilizations that existed very long ago in time. But in order to do that, I want to begin by uh, doing an exercise in what I think of as denaturalization. Um, one of the features of the United States today is that we are in fact surrounded by so many classical motifs that they have become invisible to us. Many, many buildings have a classical style of architecture. I've seen a few motifs here at the Texas Tech campus. Our coinage is very Greco-Roman in inspiration. Some, some of our uh, most well-known political institutions, such as the Senate, uh, a Roman in inspiration. In short, even today, we are surrounded by classical motifs. And so what we need to do is to remind ourselves of, in fact, how exotic ancient Greece and Rome actually are so that we can begin to retrain our eyes and our minds to see the influence of Greece and Rome in American culture. And so I do this by showing you something that's not Greco-Roman. So just to show those of you who are new to the study of the classical world, this is not a Greek temple, this is not a Roman temple, this is a Japanese pagoda. Imagine if Washington, D.C. were in fact filled with Chinese and Japanese architecture. That is how strange I want classical architecture to look to you so that we be, can begin to once again be surprised at the idea that a new colony or series of colonies um, a good 3,000 miles away from Europe would over the course of se several centuries look to these two ancient societies of Greece and Rome on which to model themselves. But instead, we don't have Japanese pagodas. We have our national capital that looks like a hodgepodge of ancient Greek and Roman architectural styles. This, of course, here is, is um, the Senate and the House of Representatives with this uh, very Roman style dome and wing architecture. Here, the National Mall, which is very Roman in its architectural style. And then here, the kind of usual odd moment uh, in America of the Egyptian revival uh, with the Washington Monument. If you have questions about the Egyptian revival, we can talk after um, at, at the Q&A. Um, but in brief, the federal city, as it was called in the late 18th century, is a monument uh, to the American experience with Greece and Rome. And every time we go there, we wallow in the presence of this modern version uh, of ancient Rome. And I also want to just show you some examples uh, of how Rome and Greece continue to grip the American imagination today, even though we think we have emancipated ourselves uh, from, from the classical tradition. Um, in the wake of 9-11, there was a series of books that was published uh, that all revolve around the question of whether we were Rome or not Rome. So I'm just showing you two examples of the titles here. If I sh had showed them all to you here, why is your point is not in Rome and are we Rome? Um, the answer here was yes uh, to, to that question. <laughs> uh, we would be here for a week if, if I talked about all of the publications that came out in the wake of 9-11. Um, I, I, love, I love this little thing right here. Um, Here's another example um, that some of you may be uh, more familiar with than 
others, uh, of the American infatuation with Roman uh, antiquity. This is, of course, not a political model for many people, but rather the kind of the sensual aspect of ancient Rome here at Caesar's Palace uh, in, in Las Vegas. Um, excuse me, I went a little fast here. Here's a, another example of the continuing <laughs> residence of ancient Rome. Uh, ancient Rome is a shorthand for Americans. We can say a lot very, very quickly when we pick up on some of the very well-known Roman motifs. Here is um, Hillary Clinton, in case you were wondering who that was. This is Hillary Clinton uh, in the wake of Benghazi being portrayed as Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Um, that, what, that complicated message was sent um, in the absence of all verbiage. Um, you guys all got that message just by looking at, at her fiddling uh, while Benghazi was, was burning. Um, I was one of the Americans that at the Democratic National Convention in 2008 was sitting on my couch at home and fell off of it when I saw what <laughs> Obama's people had constructed for him in Colorado, which was a Greco, a kind of a Greek infected Doric temple um, um, in, in the American Midwest. Um, I wondered what message he was communicating um, at that time. I'm still not sure, but I just thought it was really, really interesting um, that they chose this particular architectural style, not a pagoda, uh, not any of um, the many other architectural styles you could choose, um, but a Greek temple, I think, to say something about um, American democracy and, and how it's wonderful. This, actually, the Greek motif has sort of played out in an interesting way uh, during Obama's presidency. It has helped that there's been a lot of turmoil in, in modern Greece with the, econ the economic troubles there. But Obama as a president actually has been particularly associated uh, with, with ancient Greece during his presidency. Um, follow me, we can be like Greece. Of course, they are talking about modern Greece, but in a lot of the political cartoons that have come out about this, there's, of course, the Parthenon and, and, and various renditions uh, of ancient Greek motifs. Um, this, oh gosh, the clicker clicks over, uh, being one of them. Um, here he's being portrayed as a, a, a black base figure um, with uh, <coughs> Afghanistan in his Achilles heel um, and the shield of the United States on, on his, on his uh, hoplite shield there. So um, you can actually find a lot of these on the web if you just, maybe you've never Googled Obama ancient Greece before, but I have. Um, <laughs> this is what you get. Uh, See so you guys for that. I don't know what this is, but I found it. And <laughs> Somebody did that, and 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 you guys can decode decode the meaning of this for later. Use the uh, Laocoon and, and Obama's head, so um, we we can be semi editions perhaps later in the day and figure it out. Um, so let's now move forward a little bit and begin with Americans' infatuation with Rome to see why it was that they turned to this particular empire and republic um, so so often in in their history. Uh, here, Americas and ancient Rome. And I'll just start you off with a kind of cheat sheet uh, um, uh, for you to sort of figure out the many ways in which Americans found ancient Rome appealing. They found ancient Rome appealing because it gave them some very, very stark and useful dichotomies with which to explore their world. Now here I'm talking um, about the 18th century, when the example of ancient Rome began to loom for Americans uh, because it gave them a lot of explanatory power to understand their growing conflict with the mother country of England. And they began to turn to ancient Rome in order to make sense of a new and rather ominous political and economic situation. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why didn't they just get a political science book and look at it to figure out, you know, how is it that you think through economic and political troubles uh, during the 18th century? Well, the answer is that ancient Roman history was their political science textbook. There was no political science in the 18th century. Political science was the example of ancient Rome, and it had such a long history from uh, the founding of the Republic around 500 BC to the fall of the empire, nearly a thousand years later, that for whatever you wanted, you could find an example 
uh, to talk about, to help you to explore questions. Now, for Americans in the 18th century, the dichotomies that I've put up here of good and bad were the most powerful organizing structures for them. So they had the examples of the good Romans, Cato and Brutus, who had helped to you know, stem the tide of Caesar uh, and, and rising despotic power. A lot of the American revolutionaries liked to sign their letters as one of the personas of one of these uh, two people. They love to stand up in, in public settings and put togas on and begin to declaim um, in, in front of audiences. Patrick Henry famously does this uh, before the revolution. Um, on the bad side here are, are the bad emperors here. Nero, who we met a little bit earlier um, in the lecture, and Caesar, of course. They love this dichotomy of liberty and power, which they get from ancient Rome. Liberty is imagined as a fragile and very um, vulnerable state of being, something for which you must fight. And the bad part is the power. And Britain is imagined as having the power. It has the armies. It has the navies. And America is on the good side, the fragile holders of liberty. It's at this moment in the 18th century, in the 1760s, that we see the first appearance of the Roman liberty cap in American iconography. And the, the, the actual figure of liberty herself begins to be circulated in American text. Now, of course, the Statue of Liberty itself is, is a late 19th century statue, but we have the first Statues of Liberty in American history um, already in the 1760s and the 1770s. And they literally imagine liberty as a woman because she is fragile, she is gentle, and she must be defended um, and, and, and fought for. A third quality that they looked to for ancient Rome was civic virtue. What civic virtue means in the 18th century is that you put your country above yourself. Um, the Romans failed to do this after the bad emperors came to power, and this is why they were weakened internally and why the barbarians who were hanging around on the outskirts waiting to uh, conquer them ultimately did conquer them. So Americans said to one another, in order for our new republic, our kingless republic to succeed, every single one of us must display in our souls the quality of civic virtue. Now, this is, of course, the quality that John F. Kennedy was channeling in his famous speech about asking not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He was having a very Roman moment uh, at, at that point in asking Americans to look to what was essentially a very, very 18th century conception of Roman style civic virtue. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, civic virtue uh, as the lecture goes on. The United States was the first successful republic of the modern world that lasted. There were other republics in the modern period. The English Civil Wars gave us one republic, but that lasted not more than uh, 15 years. So the republic, as it was conceptualized and fought for by Americans from 1776 to 1783, was imagined as an extraordinary achievement something that only the Romans had successfully done 2,000 years before, and had done so uh, for 500 years. So they asked themselves, we now have a republic. How is it that we keep this republic from declining and descending uh, into, uh, into monarchy, or into empire, or uh, into some chaotic assortment of small states? So Rome, looking to Rome helped them to imagine how you would maintain a successful long-term republic. Finally, they imagined, or penultimately, they imagined that, that farming and rural life was the key to civic virtue. Only people who farmed, who tilled the land, were thinking of America, of the needs of America, of the really basic needs of America uh, in ways that would ensure the long-term success of the republic. So certain founders, for example, Thomas Jefferson, extolled the farm. Um, and he looked to Roman writers who had extolled the farm, Horace, et cetera, for examples, not only in the text that he wrote, but I think the most famous lines from the notes on the state of Virginia, um, those who till the earth 
are the chosen people of God. And this, of course, is in the American House of Representatives um, now. But he decorated Monticello, his, uh, his house. Uh, it's not really a house, it's a villa, I guess. Um, I don't have time tonight to talk about Monticello, but if you have questions about Monticello, I would love to answer them. Um, he decorated Monticello in the image of the bucolic Roman farming ideal that he held sacred. What's the opposite? Well, the opposite is the shopping mall, you know, and, and he, what he associates that with is the fresh, because he's been to Paris, he's seen what happens, um, and he thinks that the opposite of the virtuous farm is, is the, the debauched city of Paris, and he wants America to not be like that, which is why he buys Louisiana. This is gonna be the giant farm of America that's gonna prevent it uh, from, from becoming luxurious and, and shopping mall filled. So much for that idea, right? Um, and finally, uh, simplicity rather than luxury. So you can see one of the reasons why they're so attracted um, to, to ancient Rome is because it gives us such a wonderful and imaginative theater uh, for, for understanding uh, what they're doing and, and especially what they want to do, right? That's a, that's a lot of what we like to talk about in our in our social discourses, right? It's not only what we are, but what do we want to be? And how do we get there? And, and Rome, Rome was helping them to, to do that. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples of things that are Roman that you might not see as being Roman until you've got your Greco-Roman goggles put on. Um, so this is um, a very, very famous painting by John Trumbull. Washington resigning his commission. This was not done at the moment of the resigning of the commission. That occurred in 1783 when Washington uh, uh, decided he was not going to become a dictator, uh, and he, he resigned his commission as the head of the Continental Army. Here he is, handing back the piece of paper. Uh, what, what's interesting about this um, is that it is imagined as the moment of Cincinnati. This is the moment in 1783, and you see it's being memorialized here in 1817, when George Washington becomes the American Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is this actually rather um, shady figure in ancient Roman history. Not, not shady like he was a shady character, but we don't know a lot about him. Um, but he was, you know, was famous for, for farming his land and then being called at one point to the service of Rome, um, defending Rome very successfully against um, attackers, and then instead of becoming a warlord, returning peacefully to his farm, turning his swords into plowshares. This is the moment when Washington succeeds in doing this. Um, the Society of the Cincinnati is founded in the wake of 1783 for American Revolutionary War generals um, to honor their achievement, but also to remind American that it is Cincinnati who embodies the ideal of civic virtue uh, in, in American history as in Roman. I love this. This is an apotheosis. <laughs> in ancient Rome, you could become a god. This was apotheosis, and this, this, this could happen to emperors. And it happens in America also. This is the, the dome of the US Capitol. Here's Washington. He has literally gone to heaven, and he is sitting in heaven. He has become a god. He has experienced an apotheosis. These ladies around him are the 13 states. Um, here envisioned as, as goddesses. You see, look at all these little clouds and all of these classical motifs. This is in an American building. <laughs> a Roman apotheosis, uh, sorry, here it is, in an American building. I like that he has a lap blanket um, here. I, it's just so, it's such a quaint touch, you know, in case he, he's cold or something up there uh, in, in the heavens. Uh, this is, here's Washington again. He, he gets thoroughly classicized, in case you haven't noticed. Um, this, this is what I call a classicism gone bad. Um, he, this was a, a statue commissioned by um, uh, uh, some people, by Horatio Greeno here, uh, and they wanted to honor George Washington, who had died in 1799, but whose services to the country continued to be uh, desired because he was such a respected figure. And so this sculptor, really did his best to try to portray Washington in the image here of, of Zeus um, in, in a temple. You see he's got the seating all right, and, and it's all very <coughs> Roman. And the trouble is the context. We're in the middle of the Victorian period here, in the middle of the 19th century. And so what was 
Um, you know, art historians make the distinction between nakedness and nudity. Nakedness is just, you know, you don't have any clothes on, whereas nudity is a convention of deification in art. And so in the ancient world, the nude is portrayed as being perfect and therefore godlike. They're trying to do this with Washington, but in the 19th century context, he merely appeared naked. And uh, this was deemed pornographic, and it was <laughs> a dishonor to the national leader because uh, he didn't have his clothes on and he was consigned to the basement of the U.S. Capitol uh, for, for many, many years until he was resurrected. So, so there's ways to classicize correctly and there's ways that don't work at all. So just remember that uh, as you start to classicize things after my lecture. Um, here we go. One of the extraordinary things about America is how much our buildings, our government buildings, whether they are schools or post offices or local, state, and <coughs> federal government buildings, how thoroughly they were Romanized. And so we are not surprised by that, but we should be, because it happened at a very particular moment in American history. And it happened because of these slides that I'm showing to you here. This is the Virginia State Capitol that began to be built in the late 1780s. <coughs> So all of this happens after American independence when they are looking to ancient Rome as a model for how to build their government. The idea is Jefferson's. When he is living in France, he lives in France from 1784 to 1789. And while he's there, he takes a trip, he sort of goes on a grand tour um, to the south of France. And here he sees this incredible Roman temple uh, in the French city of Nîmes, which used to be a Roman town, and, and it's it's the real thing. You know, we, we forget that a lot of the founding fathers never left the United States. Uh, James Madison never left the United States. And here was Jefferson, one of the very few founders to go to France, and he literally fell in love with this little temple, which in French is the, the Maison Carré, the, the square house. Uh, and he wrote to one of his friends in France, he said, I am gazing at this temple like a lover at his mistress. So when I tell you that he loved this temple, he loved this temple. And he immediately wrote back to his colleagues in America in the wake of independence and said, you guys really, really need to start building buildings that look like this temple. So they did. So the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond is the result. It is an exact replica, as much as anything can be an exact replica, of the Roman temple at Nîmes, and it is revolutionary because it is the moment in American architecture when the explicit channeling of Roman Republican government is instantiated in American architecture, and then it just goes gangbusters after that. So the uh, aerial shot I showed you of Washington, D.C., is um, coming out of this particular moment in American history, and it continues today. We continue, of course, to channel Greco-Roman architecture for many, many of our uh, architectural projects, but they have their genesis at this particular moment in, in a kind of almost slavish uh, imitation of, of, of a Roman model, which is just so interesting when you know more about it. Now, some of you may have been asking yourselves, well, what's all, you know, what's in it for women, right? Women are always 50% of the population. Why are they looking to ancient Rome? It seems to be just filled with heroes and Cincinnatus and Cato and Brutus. Well, what's fascinating is that Rome also offered American women during the revolutionary period examples for how they could help to shore up uh, this fragile new republic. What I'm showing you here is the signature of Abigail Adams um, for approximately 15 years during the American Revolution when she signed many of her letters to John Adams as Portia, who is, it's not the car, right? This is the wife of Brutus, uh, who we saw earlier in the lecture was one of the, um, 
the, the sort of Romans that they idolized uh, as, as a defender of the Republic. So John and Abigail Adams are very, very interesting to American historians because uh, paradoxically, um, because they were uh, so far apart during the Revolution, they were, they were apart for about eight years during the Revolution. John Adams was busy in Philadelphia, was busy in France and England doing various diplomatic missions leaving Abigail uh, back at the farm. But they had a very, very happy marriage. And she was relatively learned by 18th century standards. And so paradoxically, the separation is what has allowed us to know this marriage better than any other 18th century marriage. They exchanged over a 1,000 letters um, at this time, which we read, of course, with great interest. And there's a particular moment when Abigail starts to use the Portia signature. And it's the moment when she is overwhelmed with her duties on the farm back in Massachusetts. She has four children in tow. And John begins to call her Portia to say to her, get on board the train. You know, we are having this revolution. I'm going to be Brutus, and you get to be Portia. And she sort of says, well, OK, and, and gets on as Portia. And so many of these letters are, are signed as Portia during the revolution. Um, these are all, by the way, this is an example of the wonders of digital humanities. These are all freely available to you at the Massachusetts Historical Society website. So those of you who are in undergraduates and doing research projects in classical reception, just go to the Massachusetts Historical Society website. You can read type scripts of these, because it's sometimes difficult to read 18th century script. But this is just a PDF that's freely available to you online um, that you can do a lot of interesting research with. But I just want to give you one more example of the ways that uh, American women were able to channel uh, the Greco-Roman example. They, they love to mythologize certain stories uh, in the Greek and Roman past. And one of these was a story that we never talk about anymore, although I know we have some classicists in the audience, so they, are, they will know the famous legend. I see somebody nodding. This is very good. Uh, the famous story of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi. Uh, Cornelia was a, a very... Um, upper class woman in ancient Rome. She's the one standing here in the middle, uh, wearing white, with her head covered like a virtuous Roman woman. And she's the mother of these three children, Gaius, Tiberius, and little Sempronia over here. And the, the legend is that this visitor in red comes to visit, and she pulls out a whole bunch of her jewels. She's a very rude visitor. She pulls out all of her jewels, and she says, look at my extraordinary jewels. And you can see here little Sempronia, because they think that women are always <coughs> wanting to go shopping. She's fondling the jewels here, um, always ready to be corrupted. Um, and, and Cornelia listens to this, and she says, pointing to her sons, these are my jewels, which I'm raising to the service of Rome. So the legend of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi, was this incredibly influential um, paradigm for American men and women to understand the role that women would play in the New Republic. The uh, usage of the name Cornelia soars in the early 19th century. Sometimes I felt like half the women uh, in the 19th century were named Cornelia. Um, and uh, the, the story is intended to show uh, that even women can have civic virtue and that they need to train their sons and also their daughters to not buy jewelry, to not go shopping, but instead to fight for the civic virtue of Rome. Just to give you an example of, of how much um, women like this, this is a 12-year-old um, embroidery of the legend of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi, which she would have gotten from an engraving. And this is, this is what girls did in school at this time. And this would take years. And this would be presented as your senior thesis project. Um, so you know, different times, different strokes. Uh, but it's very significant that it's the legend of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi. And, and here there's the little explanation underneath. All right. So there is, there is Rome for you. Uh, I also wanted to talk to you about Americans and ancient Greece, uh, because that is another powerful motif in American history. Um, but it has a very, very different career from ancient Rome. Um, and I can begin there we go, by asking, uh, by showing you some of the reasons actually why Americans 
did not like Greece in the 18th century. We, of course, assume that everybody always thought ancient Greece was a wonderful place. But that's actually a very, very new idea. It emerges in the 19th century for reasons that I'll discuss in a moment. Um, but Americans in the 18th century were actually horrified by ancient Greece. They thought Plato was very odd um, and that you shouldn't read him. You certainly shouldn't read him if you're under the age of 18 because you might be infected with strange ideas. Uh, the classical uh, Greek uh, playwrights were, uh, they were known, but they were not studied. They were also thought to be very odd. Um, so, so what's wrong with, with Greece in the 18th century? Well, very little was known about it. All of that territory was controlled by the army of the Turks and had been for hundreds of years. It was actually just really physically difficult to get to ancient Greece. And for that reason, very little accurate knowledge was in circulation about ancient Greece. It's hilarious to look at 18th century pictures of the Parthenon. Um, it, it, it's sort of looks like anything but the Parthenon, because they really had no idea uh, what the real Parthenon looked like. They also were terrified of ancient Greece because it was so democratic. Um, and, and of course, what they're channeling in the 18th century is not democracy, but a republic in the style of Rome, which is an aristocratic republic, not a democratic republic. And they want to be very, very clear about this. And so they're channeling Rome, but they're not channeling Greece. It's not until the rise of Jacksonian democracy in the period after 1828 that Americans begin to look to ancient Greece because they become more comfortable with democracy uh, in, in the wake of a number of revolutionary changes in American society, including the expansion of the franchise to all white males, regardless of property holding or not. So we see uh, classicism becoming something that is associated with democracy, and especially uh, ancient Greece. But in the 18th century, they were very, very fearful of, of ancient Greece. They also also took one look at the art, knew that there was going to be a problem, and you know, <laughs> counseled people to look in the other direction. This was very important at the founding moment, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the example of ancient Greece was very confusing to Americans and very problematic. Uh, there was a series of city-states, and there didn't seem to be any coherent narrative. Uh, the first hit modern histories of ancient Greece are not published until the 17th century. The history of Rome has an obvious narrative. You begin around 500 BC and you end around 400 AD. Very obvious, a lot of historians from Rome have already done this. Greece is more problematic. You know, what is the beginning of ancient Greek history? Where do you start? Where do you end? And what is the story? What is the overriding narrative? of ancient Greek history. It just seems to be a whole bunch of warring city-states. And Americans, frankly, don't know what to make of it. They are confused by Greece in the 18th century. The lesson that they do extract, you know, in, in so far as they are able, is that finally the ancient Greek city-states were conquered by Rome. And this has a very powerful impact uh, on American history, which I'll show you in a moment, but I want to show you the text that helped Americans and, in fact, the world to rediscover ancient Greece. So all of you who go uh, on a cruise ship to go see you know, the Greek islands, and you, you owe everything to these two people, James Stewart, uh, who, who became known as Athenian Stewart because he was so uh, associated with Athens, and Nicholas Rivette, uh, who went to Greece. They were some of the first Europeans to go to Greece who were not part of the merchant marine. And they went to Athens, hung around there for a while, and published this extraordinary monument <coughs> to the new knowledge of ancient Greece. And what is in the antiquities of Athens is hundreds and hundreds of beautiful engravings like this that show the temples of ancient Greece in all of their reconstructed majesty. And in fact, what they do is to show the modern Greeks as being very degraded. They're literally in the shadow of their great ancestors. And they begin to idolize you know, the star of the show here, the magically reconstructed, intact uh, Greek temple. The Antiquities of Athens is an extremely well-known text in the late 18th century. And it helps to turn public opinion uh, toward ancient Greece so that they create the groundwork for what we have today, which is Western civ forces uh, that begin 
with ancient Greece. They would not have done that in the 18th century because they didn't think much of ancient Greece. This is what I was talking about with Greece and American um, politics. The Federalist Papers are fascinating. Uh, I was telling uh, Steve earlier today that James Madison actually spent several months cloistered at his uh, plantation of Montpelier when he knew that the Constitutional Convention uh, was going to be happening. What better thing to do than to sequester yourself with your Greek and Roman texts and read things like Polybius in the original Greek to figure out how to create the US Constitution. So this is what James Madison is doing. And this is the lesson that he comes up with that emerges in the Federalist Papers, which is the great defense of the new Constitution that is uh, written out in Philadelphia. Hence the weakness disorders and finally the destruction of the Greek Confederacy. So if you want an example in American history of why Americans were fearful of ancient Greece in the 18th century, just read Federalist 18 and it's a litany of problems and abuses in ancient Greece and what he was suggesting was by contrast Americans should look to ancient Rome uh, to model their constitution. They should have a Senate. Uh, they should have uh, a variety of Roman features, not Greek features. Now, another reason for the growing popularity of ancient Greece in America in uh, the 19th century is not just the expansion of, of Greek motifs with the expansion of democracy, but also its slavery. They begin, especially south of the Mason-Dixon line, to be very concerned with defending the institution of slavery. And so they begin, in particular, to look to Aristotle and Aristotle's politics especially the idea of the natural slave. And they, um, there are a number of pro-slavery thinkers in the South who begin to mount uh, a defense of slavery in the wake of abolitionist attacks in order to uh, claim that the institution of slavery is not just uh, an institution to be tolerated, it is an institution to be celebrated. And look no further than the ancient Greeks to show that a mighty civilization can be based upon slavery. Part of this idea is expressed in plantation architecture in the South, which turns from the Roman motifs that we saw being expressed uh, in, Rich, in the Richmond State House uh, to, to these um, other motifs. This isn't a particularly good example because we're seeing some Roman uh, Corinthian columns here, but, but there are other examples of, of highly um, Doric architecture in, in the plantation South. Okay. So that's Greece. Now, what I want to do now is turn to a series of paintings um, that help us to imagine why it is that Americans continue to turn to Rome. And the thesis that I want to present to you is that Americans turn to Rome not because it gives them specific examples, but because it gives them a theater for their imagination. <coughs> Rome allows the United States to imagine itself onto the broadest historical stage of all, which is the mighty Roman Republic and Empire. This is the greatest empire the world has ever seen. America in 1776 is a little nothing. <laughs> on, perched on the edge of the Atlantic, a very fragile new republic. What better thing to do than to imagine that you are Goliath, that you are the mightiest empire of all. So they begin to do this after 1776, but they continue to meditate on all of the many interesting questions, dichotomies, and problems that Rome gives to Americans, and we continue to do this today. So the examples I'm going to show you uh, are a series of Painting. Some of you may know these. This is a series of five paintings by Thomas Cole, who was a painter of the Hudson River School. He painted these in the 1830s, around 1835. And the series of five paintings is called the Course of Empire series. Now, of course, in the 1830s, uh, the United States was over half a century old, and it was expanding westward rapidly. <coughs> Americans had a lot of questions about what they were doing at that time. Was it okay to be expanding westward? It was exhilarating, but it also meant near constant 
warfare with various other powers occupying the West. Was it okay for American cities to be becoming larger? New York at this time was emerging as a great financial center. Um, there was a lot more shopping <laughs> going on in America. By the 1830s, Thomas Cole and many, many other Americans had an opportunity to reflect on the past of their nation and its future trajectory. So Cole paints the course of empire series, a series of five canvases. What I want you to notice is that it's actually time-lapse photography. It's not really photography, it's painting, but it's like time-lapse photography. We're always in the same place. So in each of the five canvases that I'm going to show you, uh, look for the, the little mountain with the rock uh, at the top, and you will be anchored in place. What this allows Thomas Cole to do is to move us through time. At no point does he say that this is America. At no point does he say that it's Rome. But as we follow along, you'll see that he's doing more than suggesting an affinity between the two trajectories. So we start here in what's called the savage state. Uh, and the savage state we know is savage because the weather is like it was yesterday afternoon, uh, very, very bad. Um, and, and it looks very windy. You can see the wild, the wild trees. And here's the wild man. Do you see this wild man here? Um, he's got a bow. Uh, he's he's half-dressed. And he's chasing after the deer here. Um, there's a group of people dancing around here. And there's teepees, in case you're missing the reference to what were considered to be the savage American Indians. So this is the savage state of man. He's saying that this is the beginning of America. This is where we came from. This is the moment where the Indians um, are, are doing nothing but hunting and gathering at the very first stage of civilization. They are savages. Then he moves us through time. Here's the pastoral state, as he calls it. All of that wild uh, foliage has now been tamed, right? We are in the garden the well-tamed forest. It's like a park, you know, we're in the park. The water is calm. Here, here's our friend, the rock. Um, the sky is clear. Uh, and, and in fact, it's such nice weather that in this Stonehenge-like thing, I don't know what that means, but in the Stonehenge-like thing, the smoke can actually go straight up because the air is so quiet. We are, we are emerging into civilization now. Um, there's a shepherd here is tending the flock, and there's people here, I think they're playing bocce ball, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, here's another shepherd. Here's a little couple dancing in the forest. This was Jefferson's vision of America. This is why he bought the Louisiana Purchase, because he wanted to make America a nation of farmers like himself. He was, of course, a slave owner, but he imagined that he was a farmer. Um, only somebody else was doing the work. Uh, so this is, this is the vision of America as it was in the earliest stages after the revolution, and as um, Americans imagined the ideal era of ancient Rome to be during the wonderful early days of the Republic. Consummation. Here, look, here's, here's the rock. So we're still in the same place, but look what happened. You know, it's like the biggest developers of all time <laughs> moved in. In fact, there's so many buildings that you can hardly see the rock. It's just completely surrounded uh, by, by buildings. And a lot of them are, and this is, comes off, and they're topped with gold. You know, this is a place that has uh, so much money that the statue of Athena here, uh, of the goddess of war, um, the goddess of the arts, uh, is superintending this incredible display. The harbor is clogged with merchant ships. There's even a Roman triumphal procession happening here in the front. You see this guy, this is the Roman Empire. And if you look closely, it's, it's sort of like, where's Waldo? You know, when you have, where's Waldo? And you want to look really closely uh, at, at the little pictures, because there's funny little things going on that are very small. This is the same thing with this. It's very fun to look at, at what the people are doing. So I, I encourage you to do that if you ever have the time. But the place is, is bustling with activity. But he, it's a morally ambiguous canvas. Is this good or is this bad? Here is commerce. Here are the arts brought to their highest perfection. But somehow it's a little much. You know, there's a lot going on. And we don't see our natural selves. We don't even see nature. 
because there's so much of this luxurious civilization that has grown up. So what comes next? We, this is coming up as canvas number four, destruction. Uh, here's the rock, so we're in the same place. Something really bad has happened, <laughs> really, really bad. Um, and, but it's not quite clear. What all we know is that the weather is hurricane-like here with this swirling clouds. Uh, in, in a lot of 18th and 19th century paintings, there's a lot of uh, message that is conveyed in the weather. I don't know if you know this, but there's a way to read paintings at this time. You read them uh, from one side to the other. So the direction of the clouds and winds is very, very important for decoding meanings. Uh, but here they're swirling, uh, because, and the water's very choppy. Uh, the city is, is under attack. Um, this woman is very dramatically being pushed uh, off the ledge here. Uh, here's a statue whose head appears to have been chopped off, but I read somewhere that this is actually an actual um, ancient Roman statue that was exhumed right before Thomas Cole painted this, and it was exhumed headless. So he's in fact channeling modern archeological science as it was known circa 1830, um, but, but it looks like he just lost his head, um, as others appear to be doing uh, as they're fleeing. Here's the Roman triumphal procession that's falling into the water with the ship that's burning. Um, this, is, this is a bad scene. Now the question though, is that it's not clear what happened. Is the attack <laughs> from the outside? Or is the attack from the inside? Is this a civil war? <clears throat> was there moral rot because of the previous canvas that there was so much luxury, so much shopping, so much development, so much attention to the self and not the civic virtue that this society was made weak and vulnerable to attack, whether from internal forces or external barbarians? We don't know. This is the wonderful power of these images, is that there is a suggestion, but there is enough ambiguity in the Roman canvas that we have a theater for the exploration of our own concerns, which is always where we want to be, uh, rather than people didactically uh, giving us answers. And finally, we have the last canvas, desolation. Um, here's the rock. So we're again, and this is the only canvas that's at night. Um, the moon, the civilization, is gone. The sun has set on the course of empire. Uh, we have ruins, which during the 19th century began to be idolized by the Romantics uh, as being even more beautiful than, than the originals. Um, and a, a lot of poetry come, comes out of that realization. There's a mommy bird here who's building a nest for the, the um, sort of symbolizing the reemergence of nature in the wake of the destruction of culture. Um, I often ask my students which one they like the best, and a lot of them say they like this one the best because they think that it's the most beautiful. Um, and they like the idea, uh, you know, being environmentally uh, aware that, that nature has made claims upon culture. Um, I, I'm always interested to hear what students have to say about these canvases. But Cole once again leaves it to our debate. Is this better because nature is reclaiming society? We can start again. We can renew. We can fix our mistakes. Or is this ugly? Is it sad? Is it the sunset of civilization after the consummation of empire? We don't know. But in the wake of 9-11, these were the most famous photographs to come out of what happened in New York City. And when you have seen Thomas Cole's Course of Empire and the ambiguity of the ruins and the wake of civilization, you cannot look at these photographs that were very widely <coughs> circulated and in some ways staged by the photographer, a photographer who was visually educated in the language of Thomas Cole. You can't help but imagine that they are giving us a Roman-style theater for the imagination. And it was these photographs, I think, almost as much as anything, that provoked the searching national conversation after 9-11 about what had gone wrong. Was the problem moral rot from the inside? 
or was the problem attack from the outside? And what should we do about that? If we don't know the answer to the question, we only know that we find these images both very horrifying, but also very, very rich for our imagination and our national conversation about whether we are wrong or Greece. Thank you. Thank you.